All right, here we go. Part five, Carly Gregg's murder trial. The doc is still on the stand, and the defense is still examining him. Uh, the last video ended with asking questions about uh, Carly disclosing things to her friend. It was testimony we didn't get to hear, but her friend had testified in court that Carly did tell her she was hearing voices. How prior, how, when did she tell, when did Carly tell her this? I'm not really sure. Uh, then she asked her questions about the body cam footage of the officer that found her on the uh, side of the road, where she asked her about Carly being concerned about the stepdad and then bringing up the mom because he had cut off his cam, and he's like, he's saying he didn't hear all of it or whatever. So he didn't really comment a whole lot on that. But I know why they're bringing that up, because he Carly is saying she blacked out. So if she blacked out, why is she concerned about her stepfather? What does she remember? I mean, that... We haven't got to that. I don't even know if they're going to bring that up. Well, if she blacked out, did she say she had total recall after? I don't know. Uh, and they they brought up also the the footage where they were taking the uh, swabs of her hands to to look for the the I guess it's called GSR gun residue uh, on her hands, and it. She, he asked her, he said, she's like, well, what, what are you doing? He's like, well, we're looking for the gunpowder residue. And he said, well, what, what hand did you shoot with? And she said, this one. <laughs> Maybe she's having total recall after, after the blackout. They also have already talked about, they asked her questions like, uh, the, I'm sorry, the pro, the, the defense is asking him questions of, is, is Carly diabolical? My opinion was, why would they ask him that? It's, I think it's because uh, Carly looked diabolical in the video. Plus, diabolical is not... I don't think it's a diagnosis. I think it's just a symptom of disturbed people to be diabolical. And they also brought up being narcissistic and things like that. And I think I know why they brought that up. Because people think she might be narcissistic, sociopathic, she's she's empathetic, uh, and I think this is why they're trying to cover this stuff. I, I don't know if the jury's fallen asleep or not. I have been fascinated in his uh, testimony and the things that he was saying, and not everybody is interested in things like this. Uh, they talked about, right, I brought up, the, they talked about her blacking out already, Um Man, I don't know. I mean, they had me, then they don't. It, even if they do, I'll, I'll just say it like I did before. If, if all of this is legitimately true for Carly, that she experienced all of this stuff, and these voices and all of this stuff, she needs to be put away forever. Because it's not going to go away. And guess what? He even said it. And I, my mother told me years ago about it. <coughs> Schizophrenia. Where it gets worse as they get older. It gets worse. Carly is displaying some serious schizophrenia, if this is true, at an early age. I mean, my family member is w did display some behavioral problems, but the psychosis was worse in their twenties. That's when, that's when the crazy was coming out. The crazy was coming out, and it was clear <coughs> in the household. It was clear something is wrong. Again. The stepdad was asked a question about her behavior, what he has observed in this form or another. He said, just said, she seemed depressed. He didn't say, well, she seemed depressed and she, she was hearing voices. 
because that's that's huge guys this this is some serious stuff that this doctor has gone over with the defense about her mental stability I mean they are laying on some heavy heavy stuff and I just don't know if it's just a combination of her being a, a sociopathic, narcissistic teenager who her mother's the problem, needs to get out of the way. On top of, yeah, she may have some depression issues. And, and if she is schizophrenic, could she still control it? I I don't know. I don't have the answers because uh mental illness is 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 a tough thing. A tough thing. And if anybody's watching this and has mental illness people in their family, you know. It's bizarre. It is bizarre land. And you probably should know. And agree that if Carly has these things, and it's not just Carly being a little shit and going and killing her mother because she can't get her way. There's been other teenagers who, the Spanish, the Spanish teacher murder. Two boys got together. One boy wanted the teacher dead because she was failing him. The other boy was just a tag along. Who wanted to please his friend? That's what came out in the because I I covered some of the trial, and it was interesting what what the psychiatrist was saying. This boy would have never done this on his own. So, were they both mental? Were they schizophrenic? No, they plot and planned. They did. Obviously, it's mental to want to kill somebody. Especially over something so stupid as to failing a grade. But it was going to affect him. I'm, I'm trying to remember because it's been about a year. E either it was going to affect him of going to college or moving to the next grade. Whatever. It doesn't matter. He wanted her out of the way. But he was never diagnosed. Not like all of this. I mean, every case is different. Every kid is different in different situations. <sighs> Was she smart enough to start planting these seeds about it? I, I don't know. I don't even know. I don't even know if I, I even believe what I just said. Would she just start telling people she hears voices and, and this kind of thing? But I'm still yet to hear. Are they going to pull the stepdad back on to, to say, hey. Why didn't you say this? I, if I was the jury, I would want to know. All right. Let's get into this. Let's go. What, if any, <clears throat> diagnostic impressions did you come to based on the records you reviewed, your experience, your expertise, your evaluation of Carly, and the family members that you spoke to? Yeah, so I think I, I have maybe four. Um, so just to say, number one, her mood disorder, right? So I gave her the diagnosis of bipolar two, um, and um, I saw her as having suffered from some significant depression, and then some hypomanic episodes, and then worsening a mood that was mood disorder that was worsened by the Lexapro medication from March twelfth onward. I also gave her the diagnosis of, and it's a terrible name, other specified schizophrenia spectrum and related psychotic disorders uh, really referring to the auditory hallucinations so i think that i understood the voices she was hearing when she was younger as being um, notable but not necessarily psychosis i mean they were there but didn't really seem to affect her but i also understood that in the certainly in the week or weeks leading up to the incident the voices were becoming more prominent, more urgent, more of a problem. And I think it's reasonable to conclude 
that the voices were likely not just saying to her, oh, you're better than that guy. I think that, at least in my experience and my understanding, is that when the voices become really urgent like that, they typically um, um, say something much more, much more concerning um, than, than, oh, you're better than that, than that guy. I take, I give weight to the records from Vital Corps where Carly was reporting command auditory hallucinations um, uh, um, uh, um, shortly after she was, she was arrested. Um, so I think, and I give weight to SK's testimony this morning, and I give weight to Carly's journal entry from March 12th, um, which I'm not even sure that we've talked about, um, all to indicate that the voices, I think, were becoming a really significant problem for her um, and likely really had crossed over into the, into the domain of what I, would, what I would call psychosis. I think that I don't know whether the Lexapro was making the voices worse. I think the voices were already getting worse by March 12th before she started Lexapro. I can say, I think with some confidence, I think Lexapro was making the mood disorder worse. I'm not sure the voice, that, that that was responsible for the voices getting worse. Dr. Clark, is it fair to say that if someone is experiencing bulimia, while they're also taking prescription medication, it can be hard to know how much of the dosage they're actually retaining in their system? It can be hard to know, I think, depending on how frequent the bulimia is and, and, and when the self-induced vomiting occurs. Okay. And is it fair to say that transitioning off of Zoloft could have contributed to the, the worsening of the symptoms Carly was experiencing? I don't think so. Uh, and I'll, the, the reason I say that is, is that is that typically when people stop a medication like Zoloft abruptly, and she wasn't on a very big dose, mm -hmm. the, what they can experience are these withdrawal effects that are almost a flu-like illness, headache, achiness, brain zaps. Um, but they don't. It doesn't typically worsen a mood disorder, for example, or worsen worsen a thought disorder. So I don't think coming off the Zoloft likely had much of an impact one way or the other. Carly told me that she did not experience withdrawal symptoms of coming off. Okay. And what, if any, diagnosis did you associate uh, to Carly uh, in the form of disassociation? So what I understood was that Carly had had this really kind of low-grade dissociative experiences for a number of years where she felt distant from, the world was dreamy, um, a sort of sense of unreality um, that had been persistent um, but hadn't necessarily been a significant problem, but enough to, I think, give her the diagnosis of, I think it was other specified dissociative disorder. She doesn't, she didn't meet criteria, kind of the full criteria for major league dissociative disorder, but I think it had been there. And does a person always, are they always aware of when they're dissociating? No. I mean, some people are, um, and at other times people dissociate and, and just, for example, lose track of time. Like 10 minutes will have gone by and all of a sudden they'll just, they'll just like, what, you know, what, 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 what have I been doing? So for, I think for many people with dissociative disorders, it's just confusing for them. They don't quite know what to, what to make of it, but they know that somehow <clears throat> their life doesn't quite fit together very well. And can you explain acute dissociative reaction to a stressful event? So, yes. So, what I think happened on March 19th um, is the following, that, that Carly was, at that point, really in a mental health crisis, that she was having significant mood swings um, made worse by the Lexapro, that the voices were getting more and more of a problem for her, um, that she had documented in a journal entry on March 12th that the voices were very um, uh, problematic for her, um, that she was having these dissociative episodes, um, and that that day in particular, she wasn't able to pay attention in school. I, I, and I, I take that as a reflection of her worsening psychiatric state. So I really see her as having been in a psychiatric crisis. And then her mother finds out that she's been smoking marijuana. And for Carly, I think for any teenager, it can feel like, a, like the end of the world. I think for Carly in particular, she's so cared about her mother's approval. She's so worried about her mother being worried about her that for her, this was a crisis. Um, and so um, an acute dissociative reaction uh, is something that, uh, it's a DSM-5 diagnosis that occurs when an individual is 
triggered by some significant stress and they dissociate, meaning that they go off in some way they're not fully there, even though they might on the surface act like they're kind of there. Um, and, and they often suffer a period of amnesia uh, throughout, the, throughout this period of time. The amnesia can last from a few hours to a few days. Um, and then they will kind of, kind of come to. So can a person be experiencing this state but still seem functional to others? Yes, so, they can. And I think about, for example, people who, are, have, these, who have these dissociative fugues where they travel. Um, and people don't, I mean, they just, they, they manage to travel, they manage to get themselves across the country or whatever it is, but, but, but um, they don't necessarily look as if they're terribly impaired. Okay. And can a person be in a dissociative state and say, send a text message? Yes. Can they call a friend? Yes. Can they go to school and sit at their desk? Yes. And how long do these dissociative states typically last? I don't think there's a typical to it. Um, dissociative states can be very brief or they can be quite prolonged. You know, I mean, it, can be, it can be two minutes um, or it could be hours or it could be days or, or, or it could be years. And what if any uh, association is there between acute dissociative reactions to stressful events and violence? So, um, many people that engage in violent acts report that they were dissociating at the time and have no recollection of it. It's actually fairly common. And one of the hard questions is, how many of these people are really dissociating and how many are just saying it um, because it helps them to escape blame? Or how many um, just can't stand to think about um, what awful thing they just did. Um, so that's the, that's, that's the hard question. But the answer is that it's, it's not at all uncommon. It is known that people do this, that people engage in violence while in a dissociative state. And there are certain characteristics that are thought to be more likely to make this the real deal of association rather than malingering. And those characteristics include a past history of dissociation, um, um, a sudden, um, sudden stress, sudden significant stress, a, um, often a close relationship with the individual um, whom you are uh, uh, um, 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 violent, toward whom you are, you are violent, um, strong emotional reaction, um, and no, pr no prior planning, um, no prior threats, um, and the absence of um, history of, I guess, criminal or antisocial behavior. So those things are all thought to be consistent with or suggestive of a real dissociative reaction rather than someone just making it up. And how closely does Carly fit into those risk factors? I think Carly fits, really fits all of them. Um, the, one, the, one, the one caveat, I guess, the one thing I'd say is one other risk factor. Or people that, that, that engage in dissociation where, dissociation where it's thought to be the real deal, it's said to be more likely to have patchy the Apache amnesia, where they remember some things, not remember other things. And for Carly, it seems more like a total amnesia. Um, so that's the one thing that, that, that doesn't fit, but the other factors all tend to fit. And what is your process for arriving at your opinions? So my process is to, is to try to gather as much information as I can in as neutral and objective way as possible without coming to any conclusions. So I just want to take the information in. I do my interviews, I ask the questions, I look at the records, I try to get as much as I can, and then I sort of sit down, and it's almost as if I have um, um, the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, right? I got the pieces in place, and then what I try to do is come up with a hypothesis that fits the pieces. Uh, and what I try to do is look at alternative hypotheses. Like, let's, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. Let's look at what fits the information that I, that I have. What, if any other uh, hypothesis, did you rule out? So I think two other ones that I ruled out in particular. One is that Carly may have just panicked, right? That she's emotionally fragile. This is a big deal that, that her, her mother finding out that in the moment, she, and she's a teenager, right? In the moment, she just panicked and did something heedless. The problem I have with that, I mean, one problem is, you know, when I saw the video of the kitchen at 4.10 in the afternoon, mm -hmm. you hear the shot, she comes in, she looks to me to be 
cool and collected and unemotional. Um, I would have expected, had she panicked, that she would be quite agitated and emotionally around. I didn't see that at all. Um, and then I see um, um, her engaged in this plan to shoot her stepfather, which makes no sense to me. If she had panicked and done this with her mother, why in the world? I mean, even, even that is you know, somewhat incomprehensible. It's, but why in the world would she then plan an hour later to shoot her stepfather? That, that, makes, that makes no sense to me. Um, why would she invite friends over, over, over to the house? So uh, to me, her emotional flatness in particular and the sort of the, 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 the continuation of the, of the plan um, just, just didn't, didn't make any sense. The other hypothesis that I considered is that she's callous. Right, that she's just that's for some reason she had it in for her mother and thought her mother deserved it. Right, that she just decided she was going to do this. The problem I have with that is that so much of what she did seems senseless. That 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 that, that both like taking down the video camera and putting it in the refrigerator makes no sense to me. Um, that planning to shoot her father, um, uh, I'm sorry, her stepfather makes no sense. That having friends come over makes, makes no sense. Um, so to me, and that goes against everything that I know about who Carly is. Right? There's nothing in her past history that would indicate that she has the capability of doing something like that in such, 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 such a callous way. So those are the two other hypotheses. And so I put this together, acknowledging that it's not perfect. Right? It's a, it's a hard situation. Um, and and not everything not everything lines up, um, but I'll say that 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 I mean, the whole situation is sort of perplexing and difficult. For me, this is the hypothesis that best fits the information that I have. That I think I think Carly has a much more severe psychiatric illness than anybody realized, and that, that she was able to acknowledge, or even that she's able to acknowledge today. And that, that combined with her history of dissociation sort of created this terrible situation. And oh my goodness. I think that the fence is asking him a lot of these questions to counter-react whatever the prosecution's going to get up and say on direct already out the gate. I mean, mood disorders... He thinks that the the uh, the meds might have caused her mood disorders to worsen, not the voices, or not her being angry. But the, I put in my notes. He said mood disorder worsened with the with the uh, stop of the meds. He says side effects of stopping the meds that she wasn't on it that long. It wasn't super high of a dose. This is what he's saying. She would have had cold-like flu symptoms coming off as a side effect. Carly says she never felt any side effects from it. From what I gathered. Acute disassociation state. Okay. Now, I think they brought that up because of the video. So they can justify how her demeanor was. Because he just said she seemed pretty calm and cool. She shoots her mom, goes, sits down, and gets up and starts texting. But no, she's not diabolical. She is disassociated. Because it doesn't make any sense. He's saying, well, does any crime make sense? No. Do teenagers do something impulsively? Yes, they do. It doesn't make any sense to him that she called her friend. And then says to her friend, do you want to come see the body? Are you squeamish on dead bodies? I'm going to kill my stepdad. He's saying, this don't make no sense to me. Well, you're a psychiatrist. Well, you ruled those out? Everything has to be analyzed and picked through. At least I, that's what I would think. Okay, so you can only go by your interview with her 
her back medical records, what medicine she was taking, and clearly, you he just said, this seems out of character for her. So, he should just say, she's dangerous. She should never be let out. She's guilty. She can be guilty of insanity, yes. But she should go to a, a, a state hospital where she never leaves. Yes, she can be found guilty of insanity, but go. she needs to be locked up. And then they bring up malingering. Is she faking? They're talking about that again. I cannot wait for the the prosecution to get on and cross this witness and start asking him some more other probative questions. Here we go. Dr. Clark, based on your interviews and evaluation of Carly, your review of her medical and school records, your conversations with her uh, that you've heard from friends uh, in the courtroom and also um, you know, seeing her right after she'd been picked up by law enforcement on March 19th and in her conversations with her stepfather. Uh, you know, and you've already stated that Carly's a very intelligent child. You know, how do you make sense of someone with Carly's intelligence, you know, you know if she had planned to do this not taking the video camera down early on before texting her stepfather or engaging in any other activities. That's a so good I question. will say, I don't make too much of Carly's intelligence. I think she's bright, but she's also a teenager. Um, um, but it seemed, well, I think it's pretty clear, this is not some well-planned out scheme that she had put together. Nothing about this looks like a well-planned out scheme. Is any teenager's crime that y'all have covered or, or watched in the past that they had a well-planned out scheme? None of them did. Now, I know I keep referring to the Spanish teacher case. Those kids were complete moron dumbasses. And the psychiatrist in that ca trial, he brought up a chart, and it was really fascinating. He started talking about the brain and uh, like your... Your safety cutoff mechanisms, not fully, I call I think it's your frontal lobe. I call it your uh, safety break for adults where you're like, oh, you're, you say you're mad or something and you want to, you're like, oh, don't say that. Just keep that in your head, right? You have a safety break. You got a you gotta default there. Teenagers don't. They act on impulse. He talked about how... These two, relating to these two, and from uh, years of study, I mean, they got the, they got studies of this stuff. To where they're 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 only thinking about the moment. They're only thinking about eliminating the problem in the moment. They're not thinking about what are the consequences for my actions. What's going to happen tomorrow? What if I do this? Is this how is this going to affect the rest of my life? These are huge probing questions that adults think. Young people don't. Especially the ones who go on to commit heinous crimes. They they're in the moment. She wasn't thinking. She goes and gets the gun. And then realize, probably then realized, oh shit, I didn't get the camera. I don't know. I'm just speculating on that part of it. But, but that's the thing. Since when was any teenage crime well thought out? None of them. Not to my recollection. If anybody's watching this and anybody knows, let me know in the comments because most of all the dumbass teenagers who have killed somebody, it's all either over jealousy it's not planned out. They're acting on emotion and impulse in the moment. And then they start worrying about stuff after. Well, she didn't worry about the camera. She just calling people. Yeah, it, none of it makes sense. Why would she do this? I don't know. He's saying she's in some delusional uh, 
disassociated state. She doesn't know what she's doing. And it's ridiculous that she put the camera in the refrigerator. That's basically what he's saying. It doesn't make sense. Since when does a teenage crime of heinousness to this level make sense? None of them ever do. And what is Carly's understanding of what she had done? Oh, good question. I think Carly's understanding is that she doesn't remember, but she thinks that she must have done it. I think that's her understanding. I don't think she has any more insight than that. And you know, on, on one hand, Carly appeared calm and, and cheerful with the dogs when she got home um, and then kind of engaged in a senseless plan and hid the video camera in the refrigerator. Does that fit a psychopathic um, model? So I guess that psychopaths, if we'll use that phrase, are capable of having a really poorly thought out plan. For me, what doesn't fit the psychopathic model is what we know about her emotional and psychological. But what we know about her emotionally and psychologically, we know that she cared for her mother, we know that she cared for her stepfather, we know that she cared for her friends, we know that she wanted to do well, we know that she had not engaged in criminal behavior of really any significant sort. That's what doesn't fit the, 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 the psychopathic model. And I never thought she was that. I thought she was more of a sociopath, not a psychopath. Because she only cares about herself. But that's just my observing her in the courtroom and how she responded to different things. Which I stated in the last video. So she doesn't remember killing her Dr. mother. Dr. Clark, are you aware of... Um Based on your experience, expertise, and evaluation of Carly, do you believe that Carly was able to under, understand the nature of her conduct and appreciate the difference between right and wrong at the time this incident occurred on March 19th? Good question. I don't think so. And based on your experience, expertise, and evaluation of Carly Gregg, do you believe that she did not know or could not appreciate right from wrong on the afternoon of March 19th? I do. Okay. And do you believe she understood the nature and quality of this act on March 19th at that time? No. Wow. Your Honor, at this time I would ask that Dr. Clark's mental health evaluation be admitted into evidence. Any objection? Same objection. Sustained. I have no further. Uh, we tender the witness. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, let's take our afternoon break. Everyone remain seated while the jury exits. All right. The defense just got finished with direct. Now we have the prosecution getting on. Man. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I'm on the edge of my seat. I like stuff like this. And look at Carly's face. Is that it? Did it work? <laughs> I don't know, man. This is. They covered a lot of stuff. Uh, she doesn't remember killing her mother. Okay? They they established that with this doctor. He's saying she doesn't remember, according to Carly, doesn't remember. She didn't know right from wrong. That's what he said. Though we believe in that. She didn't know. She don't know right from wrong. Oh, and I didn't even, I forgot to bring up the uh, the handwriting. I remember the journal. You had a journal and you had a sketch pad. And apparently the parents did know about it because they found some of the, there was some kind of writing, some creepy writing. Carly had wrote, well, she's saying she don't, she don't know what, what it is and how it got in her room. But it was some, some uh, writing that apparently wasn't hers, and then it got obscure writing and this kind of thing. And I'm like, well, what? Is she possessed by a demon? What's going on here with, with, the, with the writing? So that was brought up by the defense. And even, the, yeah, and, and then the parents uh, had known about it and questioned her about it. But uh, here we go. 
here we go. Uh, we'll bring the jury back in the table and make a motion at this time to exclude uh, Clark's testimony and have it stripped from the record because he never uh, rendered an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Um, he never stated those words in his uh, direct exam. He was never asked um, if, he, if his opinion was a reasonable degree of medical certainty. And so um, the state would make that motion at this time. Um, the state's also in a predicament at this point um, because if we ask any questions at this time, Your Honor, then obviously they're going to be allowed to come back and, and uh, redirect him. So at this point, um, pursuant to Ketchings versus State and many other uh, many other cases in Mississippi, we would make a motion to exclude um, and stricken Dr. Clark's testimony from the record at this point because it, none of his opinions were rendered to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Yeah. Response. Does anybody have a copy of Ketchings for me? Uh, no, sir, Your Honor. I have a copy of it. Do you have a site? Yes, sir. I apologize. I They want to strike his testimony from the jury? Any further argument in the way of the motion? Um, Your Honor, the only, the only thing he gave an opinion to was to uh, best hypothesis, and I would also state that um, as Ms. Eaton to just search certain terms um, during during the break and uh, search of, such as reasonable medical certainty, and there are no references to that um, in the record. Response. It was his opinion, but isn't that what all psychiatrists do? Is give opinions? It's not In a medical certainty. Particular ten five, correct? Is that what you were looking at? Um, I think so, Your Honor. I mean, none of it is a medical certainty when it comes to this crazy people, unless a certainty is that is the they're crazy. No, 684 Southern 2nd, 591. <clears throat> what? Wow. Because all his testimony was hypothesis. They wanted... I don't know if that's going to fly. Your Honor, may the defense have a short break to read this case as it's not been provided to us? Sure. I mean, even if they don't want the, the, the transcripts to go back to them, the, the, the jury heard all of that. I mean, you can't get that back. And they never did any objections during the whole testimony. But I guess they were just waiting to see how he was testifying, which it was his opinion. Wasn't that what it always is with psychiatrists? It's just their opinion. And on studies that they've had and statistics they have with other patients and... And they know about these drugs. They know these drugs, like he was saying, these drugs whack some people out, and some people they do find different drugs affect different people in different ways. <coughs> I mean, he diagnoses her with being bipolar, too. Now, was that his opinion? Or that was his diagnosis. I don't know if they're going to win this one, guys, the prosecution. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I don't... Uh... I don't think so. They object to his... They want it all stricken. That's, uh... Wow. 
also do they are they fearing it that, that it it might have had some some lividity I guess if I was the prosecutor I'd get up and say yeah if you believe him she should be locked up forever leave it in there because she should be locked up forever if you think he he's right or you're going to believe yeah, our the story case that they cited specifically states that with a reasonable degree of medical certainty is a useful shorthand expression that is helpful in forestalling challenges to the admissibility of expert testimony care must be taken however to see that the incantation does not become a semantic trap and the failure to voice it is not used as a basis for the exclusion without analysis of the testimony itself. Any further argument? We would argue that based on the case they cited yourself, Your Honor, that their motion must be denied because the basis of the medical testimony itself went to the certainty that he went through in making his hypothesis, what he ruled out, his method of evaluation, uh, how he comes to his conclusions. We went over who he talked to, what he reviewed, and at this point in time, that in and of itself, that statement is just being used as an incantation to exclude. Reply. Yes, sir, Your Honor. Um, to my recollection, uh, Dr. Clark simply testified that his best hypothesis was basically the opinion that he stated. Um, while the state admits that the case states that you don't have to use the specific terms to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, you have to render an opinion somewhat in that line. And he hasn't stated that his opinion to any reasonable degree of medical certainty at all using any kind of terms. He certainly, he just simply talked about his training and education that he used in arriving at his conclusion. Not that his conclusion itself was to a reasonable degree of medical certainty or anything even close to that. And so, uh, your, your Honor, as we argued yesterday and as the court, um, you know, deliberated back and forth with itself yesterday over whether or not to allow this testimony in, this is the exact type of diminished capacity testimony that we were bringing up yesterday and now it's here and the jury's heard it and the state would argue that it doesn't meet the standard um, under rule 702, 703 or under the case law of the state. All right. This is only the court's ruling. Here we go. In this state we have a long tortured history with uh, procedure. It seems that procedure changes from case to case based on who the parties are, what type of case it is. Um, and every time a case gets reversed for exclusion, it comes down to this overarching appellate court favor towards the defendant being allowed to put forth the theory of their defense. As a practical yeah. matter, this trial judge, maybe wrongly, believes that we can't unring the bell. I think the jury's already heard the evidence. Uh, I think even though they could say that they've put it aside, we, we, we would presume that to be true. However, although very imperfectly stated, he did, at the very end, give a, an opinion in line with McNaughton. He, Course, going to overrule the motion to exclude. Um, of course, going to overrule the motion to exclude. All right. Anything further from the state? Bring them in. I think that was a good call. Kind of took took us a, a few minutes to get there, guys, but. Um, I wanted to see what, what was going to happen there. I didn't want to skim through that. Because I started to skim through to get to 
the next witness because they went on break and that kind of stuff. And then uh, it's kind of difficult to find the spot, though. So I had to come back. I had to wait uh, to the end when they came back. And then the, the, here comes the prosecution saying, we, we want it stricken out. Wow. And I think the judge is right. I think this goes with the other motion. Um, the prosecution wanted uh, stuff not put in about the doctor. Something to the effect of the meds, and he let it in. And I think he's right to do this, too, because she could use it on an appeal if she's found guilty. So the more he lets in, let the chips fall. Guys, it... They could stand up and go, if you believe him, if you believe the psychiatrist, that she, all of this list of stuff that she has, then you still need to find her guilty. And she needs to be put away for a long time. She is a danger to society. Whether they could get up and say that, I don't know. I'm a lame person. Lame in person. But. Or you buy our story. She was cold, calculating. She was diabolical. Look at the video. Look at the evidence. Carly wanted to do what Carly wanted to do. Maybe it's all the above. Carly wanted to do what Carly wanted to do. She is a psycho. She is schizo. She's all of this. So it's even more impacted to... Uh... Convict her. That's just my opinion. Here we go. Cross of the doctor by the prosecution. All right. Good afternoon again, Dr. Clark. How you doing? Good afternoon, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, it, uh, as you can imagine, I have a few questions for you. Um, couldn't let you get out of Mississippi without asking you a few. Um, so you, you uh, talked a lot about um, your opinion that you rendered uh, in this case with Ms. Todd. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And I just want to um, want to ask you a few questions about that opinion. So uh, as I understand it, you were you you stated that you were retained towards the end of August. Is that correct? Uh, in the middle of August, I believe, was my first phone call with Attorney Camp. Okay. Does it uh, sound about right that you were retained around uh, August twenty fourth? It's quite possible, yes. Okay. And then five days later, on August 29th, you evaluated, um, you flew down here and you evaluated uh, Miss Greg here, correct? Correct. All right. Um, and then four days later, on September 3rd, you rendered what was ultimately your report in this case, right? Your opinion. Correct. All right. Um, and, Doctor, whenever you're retained, on a case, um, and how many times you say you testified as an expert witness? I think I said over 150. Okay, so and you, but you said this is the first time that you've testified in Mississippi, correct? Correct. All right. Whenever you're retained on a case, um, what do you do to familiarize yourself with what the standard is that you're going to be testifying about in whatever state it is you're retained? What I usually do is, uh, well, do an internet search and try to find either the statute or the case law or whatever whatever is, is relevant. Right. And I'll also talk to the attorney about okay. what their what's what they feel the legal the legal requirements are. Did you have a conversation like that with uh, Mr. Camp? I did. Okay. Did he provide you with what the legal standard was in Mississippi? He did. Yes. Okay. And I believe um, that whenever we talked the other day, you told me that uh, you looked up the statute in Mississippi. Is that correct? Yeah, I told you I was wrong, but I told you that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Because um, in fact, there's no there's no statute, is there? I don't believe there is. Uh, so <laughs> right. I, I, look, I looked up the standard, but they're not the statute. Right. Right. Um, now, uh, you, you've obviously talked about it. You evaluated Carly back here, right? Yes. And approximately how long did that evaluation take? About four hours. Okay. Um, and you stated that uh, Ms. Todd was present during that uh, evaluation, right? Correct. All right. And that's the same Ms. Todd that's present with Ms. Gray here today, correct? Correct. All right. Um, and that's the only time you've evaluated Carly ever. Yes. All right. You never treated Carly before August 29th uh, of 2024? No. All right. You've never reviewed any of her records until presumably you received them sometime after August 24th, correct? 
I'm, I think that's correct. The records, I may have gotten records a few days before then, okay. um, but, but that's generally correct, yes. All right. Uh, Dr. Clark, whenever you evaluated um, the defendant, Ms. Gregg, here, uh, did, she, uh, did she know who she was herself? Okay. Yes. All right. Oh. Um, did she appear that, to be dissociating the day that you evaluated her? She didn't appear that way. She reported that she was to some extent, but not that I could tell. Okay. Um, so what exactly did she report? Who did she report to that she was dissociating that day? Well, she told me that, right. that in a somewhat chronic way, she'd been feeling the sense of being separate from the world and that things were sort of dreamlike still. Um, it didn't happen all the time, but it happened when she was having evaluations or when she would go to court okay. more, more than, than other times. But the fact that she was dissociating based off her own terms, um, whenever you evaluated her, that didn't affect your opinion as to the things she told you, did, did it? No, it did not. Okay. Um, did she know at the time if she, that you evaluated her why she was there being evaluated? I believe so, yes. All right. Um, did she know why or in what role that you were there? I believe so, yes. Did you talk to her about that? I did. I explained who I was at the outset. And you actually told her um, that you're there, and I believe in your report, Stacey, that you're actually there on behalf of her attorneys, correct? Correct. The attorneys who were representing her in her murder trial, right? Well, I told her that I was there. I'd been retained by the attorneys to do an evaluation um, that the attorneys may wish to, might choose to use, uh, and they might have me, have to, they might choose to have me testify as well. Right. Um, you also stated that you conducted um, a Zoom interview with uh, Ms. Gray's stepdad, Mr. Heath Smiley, on um, August 31st, 2024. Is that correct? Correct. And that lasted about 90 minutes, right? Yes. But neither the evaluation that you conducted with um, Ms. Gregg nor the evaluation for 90 minutes that you conducted with Mr. Smiley, you didn't video record or any other way record those, did you? Well, I only took notes, but I did not record them in any other way. Okay. <clears throat> did you ever provide wow. those notes to uh, Mr. Camp or Ms. Todd? I have not provided them, nor have I have not been asked for them, nor have I provided them. Great, thank you. Um, So in forming your opinion in this case, um, you relied basically on your memory from what, when you evaluated uh, Ms. Gregg along with the notes that you took as it relates to the evaluation, right? Yes. And then the other documents and things that you looked at as well that you already testified about. That's correct, yes. Right. Um, he should have recorded it, just saying. I'd want to see her demeanor. You talk about um, in your report some of the documents and things that uh, that you reviewed. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Um, and I see some counseling records from when Carly was younger. Did you review those? I did. All right. I see some uh, what appear to be, I guess, medical records from I get her pediatrician. Is that correct? Yes, it is. All right. Um, and then. You go on down there uh, and you say that you uh, review some home videos, is that correct? Yes. Um, I believe that's number nine on your report. Which videos did you review? There were two videos that I reviewed. One was a video from the kitchen um, around, I believe around 4.10 p.m. on Tuesday, March 19th. Okay. And the second was a video that was taken, uh, I believe, from, a, from the garage um, that occurred at the time of, of the shooting uh, of um, Mr. Heath Smiley. Were you provided or did you mm. review the videos from when Miss Gregg and Miss Smiley came home from school? Was that depicted on the videos that you watched? It was not depicted on the videos that I watched. I'm not sure whether it may have been provided to me, um, but I did not see it. Okay. What? So was the only video that you saw from inside the house the video where you can actually hear the shooting? Yes. And then oh, okay. how long after that in the video sequence did you watch? I was for several minutes before then and for several minutes after then. Okay. Um, but I, I'm, to my best of my estimate, it was no more than 20 minutes total and probably somewhat less. Okay. I, I had saw the video the first time with just Carly coming with the dogs and then the whole scenario of her going and getting the gun and killing her mom. Then when I was doing these videos, 
I actually saw when the mom came home. I saw that part I hadn't seen yet. And watching it in its entirety from when they both came in the, the door and seeing her mother, it affected me. It, it gave it another notch of, oh my God, right? It's already, oh my God. But now I've seen her mother. I've seen her mother come in and out of the kitchen do something with her phone, set it on the counter. She's looking out the window, uh, I guess seeing what Carly's doing. Goes back in, She like she got something out of Carly's room, took it to her room. She came back to Carly's room. It was so impactful to me. It was even more impactful seeing her mother, let me just reiterate, in the whole entirety. And I'm not a doctor, but I was like, holy smokes, there's her mom. Oh my God. You know, I hadn't seen it yet. I've been busy doing the other stuff, and I ha I didn't get the chance to dig for it because I don't have a tech helping me dig. But he's saying he only he didn't see it from when they walked in the door. Is that what I'm hearing? He just saw from the time that she went and got the gun and killed her mother and heard the shots. You gotta see that whole thing because it's like. It, it just put it on another level for me personally. I'm, I'm just going to say that. And he's a doctor. And then you also mentioned some um, sheriff office reports. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Um, and you say that you reviewed some police reports regarding texts sent by Carly on 31924. Is that correct? Correct. Did you ever actually see the actual text messages, the printout of the text, or were you just relying on the police officer's reports? I never actually saw the printout of the texts. Okay. Um, I, so I, I had to rely on just, just the police officer's report. Okay. And would it be helpful in rendering an opinion um, to have the actual text where you can look at uh, kind of the context and how they were texting back and forth? Would that be helpful? I think it likely would have been helpful, yes. Okay. Wow. And these friends that it's talking about that uh, Miss Gray was texting back and forth with, did you reach out to any of these friends to interview them? I did uh, interview one of them, yes. Okay, and who was that? That was uh, a juvenile uh, called BG. Okay, all right. And what did, uh, what did your interview, what, did you rely on that interview with BG? No. Okay, did you actually talk to BG? I did. You did, okay. What did BG tell you? What BG told me was that he was good friends with Carly, uh, that they had been friends for at least a few years, that, um, that she was very bright and that she tended to hang out with uh, um, the academically successful kids and he wasn't necessarily one of those. He told me that she was outgoing and bubbly and friendly and had good energy. He told me that um, somewhere around February of this year that um, uh, they began to uh, um, text or be communicate somewhat less with one another. He wasn't quite sure why. He told me that he became aware around early March that she was um, smoking marijuana uh, and that um, he was concerned about it and talked to her about it. And he told me that he had told, he had decided to tell Carly's mother about that and in fact did so on the afternoon of Tuesday, March 19th. Right. Did he also tell you, tell you that Miss Gregg reached out to him and asked him to come over um, after she shot and killed her mom? He did. He told me that she had FaceTimed him and um, that she had asked him to come over and that he asked for the address um, and that he was actually heading over, but I think uh, at that point it was too late. Okay. <clears throat> did he say anything about uh, whether or not Carly told him why she was asking him to come over? He did not say that okay he did not say that but carly yeah. knew and recognized him at the time correct i believe i think it's a reasonable supposition yes and oh. she reached out to him um between whenever she shot and killed her mom and whenever she shot her dad correct or her stepdad i believe so yes good question <laughs> In your report, uh, Dr. Clark, you talk about um, present circumstances. Do you recall that, uh, I think it's down at the bottom of page two, do you um, recall writing that section in your report? I do. All right. And in there, uh, what are you talking about present circumstances? Is that like as we sit here today? 
I, I was talking about how Carly was doing, how she reported how she was doing at the time of my interview with her on August 29th. Right. And you state that she chooses not to meet with mental health, both because it requires submitting a request and because she does not find it helpful, correct? Correct. And that's what she told you? Yes. All right. You go on down there. Um, you go on to say in the beginning of the next paragraph that uh, she's cried a lot as the reality began to sink in. Do you say that? Do you see where she told you that? I do. All right. Um, and the reality that she's talking about is the fact that she killed her mom. Correct. I think it's probably, uh, that's certainly, certainly a piece of, well, no, actually, I take it, no, I, I don't know that that's correct. I think that the reality that my understanding that she was referring to was that her mother was dead and that she was incarcerated. Okay. I don't know to what extent she believed or knew that she had actually killed her mother and to what extent that meant something to her. I just don't know because she didn't say that. Right. And you saw, you were, you talked about it on uh, your direct with Ms. Todd, and you sat in here with um, Deputy Shaq this morning and you watched the video, correct? Correct. And you heard her uh, say whenever he, they asked her which hand did she shoot with, and she identified her right hand, correct? I actually, I didn't, I didn't hear that piece. I told the attorney, I testified with Attorney Todd. I didn't actually catch that, that one piece. That, that is what you said on direct. Um, and you also uh, heard Deputy Shaq say that, um, um, she was asking about her stepdad, correct? Correct. And that uh, that she apologized to Deputy Shaq. She said, I'm sorry, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> but it's still your opinion that you don't think that she knows that she killed her mom. Uh, do you mean at that point in time or do you mean right now? Specifically? Well, at that point in time, do you think she knew she killed her mom? I think that I think that I don't know what she knew at that point in time. And that's because we can't get inside people's heads, correct? Yeah, nobody knows. I do my best. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. I understand. But in general, we can't get inside someone's head and see exactly what they're thinking, can we? No. We can only look at what they tell us. Is that right? Not only that, other things as well. Their actions. And their actions, their demeanor, their mannerisms, what other people tell us, the records that we can review. Right. Sometimes we can do brain scans and psychological testing, not in this case, but, but, but we don't know for sure. Right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> now, you go on in your report um, and you talk about um, early history. And I assume that you're talking about prior to age nine, because then you have a separate section where you're talking about ages nine to 14, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and down at the bottom of page three, I think it's the next to the last uh, paragraph down there, um, you state in general, and, and um, again, this was prior to age nine, um, according to what you just said, in general, she did not, uh, she was going to therapy at a young age, correct? Correct. All right. But in general, she did not find it helpful. Uh, again, we see that, so that's kind of been a common theme, right? She didn't find therapy helpful back here, and she didn't find it th helpful whenever she was younger, correct? Correct. All right. Um, she didn't like or trust some of the therapists, and she found that some seemed to be simply trying to get information to be used against her father. Is that correct? Correct. That's what she told you? Yes. And you mentioned her father a couple times earlier, and you said that um, maybe you reviewed some records or something that he had bipolar. Uh, did you ever reach out to Mr. Gregg? I did not. Okay, you never talked to Mr. Gray. No. So, other than a couple pages off of a medical record, did you did you ever see any medical record where he was diagnosed with bipolar? I did. You did. <clears throat> I saw Doctor Doctor Hardy's record. Right. Um, I think on two occasions where he was diagnosed and treated for bipolar disorder. And you're aware that was just he was uh, sent there due to some court order or something in their chancery case. Uh, I'm actually not sure why he was why he was there. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and then if you turn the page in your report over there to the top of age four, uh, page four, and we're still talking about. So you think he brought that up because it, uh, her, her real dad being diagnosed with bipolar was maybe BS? 
because he was being sent there for some other thing he did and he's trying to get out of it? Did y'all think that? That that could be? Why? Wow. That's crazy. And she, he, he, did you see how long he paused when they, when he asked him, did, did she know what she did at that moment? He's like, I don't know, what, what was it, 30 seconds to a minute? He, and then he said, no. Because he doesn't know what she, he can't get inside her brain. He can only do a hypothesis, an analysis of information, and then make a judgment on what, th that's what we all have to go on, right? That's what we all have to go on, and the same is for him. Damn, this is good questioning. This is going very well for the prosecution. Uh, prior to age nine, um, in the first full paragraph, about midway down, uh, she said, um, Carly said she tried to act happy in front of others, um, although she was aware that she was a putting on she was putting on a show. And you talked about that earlier, isn't that correct? I did. That she's good at putting on a show. Yes, yeah, she's good at putting a good face forward in spite of whatever difficulties she may be having. Wow. Right. That's now, I just huge. want to be clear, Doctor. So, Boom. kind of we'll jump forward just a little bit, just to, as we talk about this, we kind of have a mutual understanding. So, your opinion ultimately is that from the time that she got home and she took out the dogs, that she blacked out at that point, correct? Yes. And that she doesn't come to until the police pick her up, correct? Correct. But she remembers everything else that day. Yes. She remembers waking up and being irritable Grumpy. that morning. Yes. Okay. And but that that one one hour or so period, an hour and a half period, that's the period that she doesn't remember. Correct. And Damn. depending on uh, which side you sit over here, that could be fairly convenient, right? Yes. <laughs> Yes, it certainly could. Seems like a convenient time period, doesn't it? Yes. <clears throat> Damn. Convenient. I want to talk a little bit about um, accurate information. Is, is it important in your evaluation to receive accurate information? Yes. All right. Is it important to receive uh, complete information? As much as possible, yes. Okay. It's never it's never completely complete, but but yes. Right, right. Um, and I believe you stated that all of the documents that you received in this uh, trial, or in, in this case, that you only received those documents from Mr. Camp or someone on the defense side. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. So the only documents that you were able to review were the documents that they sent you? Correct. No one else sent me documents. Right. And then your other... Uh, the other things that you relied on was your interview with Miss Gregg, correct? Yes. And your interview with her stepdad, correct? Yes. And as I testified, my training, education, experience, and I got knowledge of the literature. If you don't have uh, proper facts, can you render a proper opinion? No. Isn't it true that, and you kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, isn't it true that someone can fake uh, a mental illness or in, insanity. Yes. Is it true that someone in Carly's position who's been uh, charged with a crime such as murder might have a motive to try to fake um, insanity or a mental illness? Yes. Wow. This is going systematically, bam, bam, bam. But, but yes, we already know they brought up that people can fake this. Is there more evidence of her hearing the voices other than her telling her friend? I haven't heard. Did she see another doctor to say this, to say this stuff? Is it, it was convenient for her to black out for an hour? After saying she blacked out during that, that instant and then she's... She can fake being happy. She even said she can fake being happy. This is bad. Bad that she in the past has said that she faked stuff. But I don't know, guys. You can't fake schizophrenic, though. I mean, clearly, 
you schizophrenic, you crazy, you are cray cray. And people are going to know it that's around you and live in your home are going to know it. That is a fact, Jack. All right. So I want to keep moving forward in your four a little bit um, where uh, the next section you go down to um, ages 9 through 14. Is that correct? Correct. So we're talking age 9 until the age up until uh, when this event happened earlier this year in March, correct? Yeah, actually, actually, there's a subsequent section that starts January of 2024. Gotcha. So I'm talking about age 9 up through December of 2023. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, and the top of page 5 there, you talk about that there were... Um, two incidents of Carly getting in trouble prior to January of 2024. Um, and you mentioned that one time is when she snuck out of the house and another time is whenever she shared some test answers with the entire class. So those, the two incidents that you were aware of of her getting in trouble. Uh, yes, I think I had already refer referred to the knife in school incident at okay. some other point in time. Okay, do you know where that is in your report? Ooh. I, as I sit here, I don't know. And I, I think actually, um, I don't have it right here in front of me either, but I think actually on direct exam with Ms. Todd, you stated uh, that she told the school, well, first of all, did you review any records from the school? No. Okay. Um, I didn't think so because I didn't see those listed here, but you say, you, you told Ms. Todd that she um, supposedly took that to school because a friend either asked her or told her to, correct? That's what she had told me, yes. Okay. I think in your report you actually say that it was left in some pants from hunting or something along those lines. Is that correct? No. That's not, okay. No. All right. Um, do you, again? Well, keep in mind, too, a moment ago I did want to bring up when the prosecution was asking him stuff, the doctor did admit on direct that there were, he didn't have everything when he examined her. He said it. I guess the, the defense brought it up because they knew the prosecution was going to. And I was saying, why would he do that? What was the hurry? Why would he not just, okay, can you send me everything, everything? And why would he not get school records? She is a child. School records, her behavior in class, stuff, the t notes the teacher wrote, how, what did she take to school, a knife, she had to go to this other school. You need all of that in your evaluation. At least I think so. I, I just wanted to point that out. We'll, 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 we'll keep going through and we'll find it here in a second. Um, all right. Um, are you aware that uh, whenever she was confronted by the school for bringing the knife to school, um, she originally told them that she brought it because somebody asked her or told her to? Is that what she told you? No. She told me that's the reason why she did not talk to me about what she had said originally to the school. Okay. So she... Originally okay. told the school that uh, she brought it because somebody yeah, told her. Sure. We want to get it straight. Did she accidentally leave it in her pants pocket? Which is a possibility. Or did she do it because somebody told her to? Or did she just do it because she wanted to? I don't know. He's doing a great job, guys. I, I think he's doing good poking holes into this diagnosis, and it's a hypothesis. Carly probably knowing she is. She, why is she smiling? She is disassociated. I'm not mistaken. That's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. Ah. 
Look at the look in her eyes. Oh my god. That look on her face. She is not happy with this cross-examination. Because he is saying she knew what she was doing. And I think she knows it. She knows what, what's happening. He is coming after him. Yeah, are they everybody going to believe that you blacked out? <clears throat> Somebody in the chat saying it's her mother's parents that are supporting her. That's the grandparents. I, I have no confirmation on that. This is, um, he's doing a good job poking holes in this because I was like, well, what's he going to ask him? I knew her blacking out was going to be a big one. Poke holes in that. What is it convenient? Oh, and then the dad being bipolar. He did not reach out to him. Did you know it was because he was sent somewhere to be evaluated because he'd been getting in trouble? All right, Dr. Clark, sorry about that. Um, I handed you a document that's already been uh, produced in evidence um, as uh, D-15. And I'll give you a second to read that if you, if you, if you would like. Uh, okay, I've read it. Okay. Well, and um, when Carly was first asked, um, and this is by the assistant principal at Northwest Rankin Middle School, when she was first asked why she brought the knife to school. Um, whenever she first was asked why she brought the knife to school, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Clark, Dr. Clark, um, she said it was for her protection, correct? Correct. All right. And then um, she was talking about a high school, uh, high school student who was supposedly threatening her, correct? Uh, I don't see that in there. I think she said that she needed to protect herself from high school students. Okay. Okay. Um, then the last paragraph there says a uh, meeting with Carly's mother occurred that day. She was notified that she would have to um, follow protocol. Uh, let's see. Um, Defense objected to her being having self-defense weapon. Yeah. And remember, Carly was saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So she must have had total recall when the cop got her. Sergeant Shaq, was that his name? What was that Shaq? The ball-headed guy. She was saying she was sorry, sorry, sorry. So what is she sorry for? She knew she killed her mom. Now she's asking how is her dad. That's the, the next bait stamp number um, document in, in that. Uh, these, these both have bait stamps of 475. Okay. And down there on the bottom of that 475, you see that indeed Carly changed her story, didn't she? Uh, yes. Oh, and she stated that the that the first reason that she said for protection just seemed more logical, correct? Correct. Right. So in essence she lied. Yes. Well a lot of teenagers lie, but still that's a good point, guys. She lied. About a knife, a weapon. And back on in your report, we were talking about the two things, and you stated um, that she snuck out of the house and that she shared test answers. And then you said you'd already mentioned the knife, correct? Correct. And did she tell you that uh, she was operating on a burner phone, text, texting other people, correct? Yes. And I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. And so in December of 2023, and then later in the in the winter of 2024, she told me she was uh, using a, a either an old iPad or, or a burner phone. Right. 
Now, proceeding down in your report there, you talk about, um, you say that Carly was asked about her mood for the last five years, correct? Yes. All right. And so that's up from, when, when is that time period covering that five years? I think age nine to 14. Okay. Something like that. All right. And you listed some stuff there. Um, that you said that she was doing that were kind of out of characteristics for Carly. Uh, you said that she got a piercing, she got a tattoo, correct? Yes. And I was also at school. Yes. And But then in the bottom of that paragraph, you state that uh, she told you she never became paranoid or lost touch with reality, correct? Correct. So at least until uh, January of 2024, she had never lost touch with reality, correct? I think that's fair to say, yes. Okay. And if you continue coming down there in the, um, in the next paragraph, you talk, you see where she talks about uh, that she started um, or that she reported experiencing a voice in her head for as long as she can remember. Um, is that what she told you? It is, yes. Okay. And she told you basically that it was simply telling her uh, elitist things. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Stuff such as you're better than them. Correct. <clears throat> Is a narcissistic demon. But at that time, it was certainly not telling her uh, any, I guess what you would call auditory or command hallucinations, correct? Yes, I mean, it does qualify as an auditory hallucination, right? but not a command hallucination. Exactly, thank you. So, and the first time that she ever reported any command hallucinations was whenever she was actually already in the jail that year, correct? Or after she had been arrested. I think that's true. I don't know the specifics of what she reported to her friend SK before the incident. I just don't know. Right. But as far as I know, in the jail was the first time, yes. But she started- Yeah, because I wanted to know, I stated earlier, when did she tell the friend this? Now, the friend testified we didn't get to hear. So when was this? When did she tell her, Carly tell her friend she heard these voices? Big questions about the voices, guys. Certainly never reported any command hallucinations to any health care providers that she was seeing, correct? That's correct. And that kind of takes us up to Ju- to January of 2024, whenever Miss um, Smiley, Ashley, her mom, started taking her uh, to see a couple of different therapists and um, nurse practitioners, correct? Yeah, I think one therapist and one nurse practitioner. Right. Yes. <clears throat> Did she tell them she was hearing voices? Shouldn't he have called them, her therapist? Shouldn't that doctor have called her therapist and said, hey? You also talk about, um, at the top of page six in your report, it says that, uh, again, this is between the age of nine to 14, so up at least until July of 2024, Carly denied ever losing large chunks of memory and denied others suggesting that her behavior had been unusual in ways she could not recall. So at least up until January 2024, she had never lost any large chunks of memory, correct? That's correct. She never, she reported that she had not. And again, all this is just based off of what she, tell, what she told you. That is based on what she told me, yes. After she's been charged with murder, correct? Yes. <clears throat> Wow. I think that was pretty. And that leads us up to the kind of mm. subsections you have here where, we're, where you talk about January to March of 2024. Right? Correct. And that's, again, that's kind of the time period that you focused on in your report because that's whenever she begins getting prescribed Zoloft, correct? Correct. And she's going to see some different therapists and things like that. Or going to see a therapist. Correct. <clears throat> And you talk about the fact that uh, Carly's mom found out that she had a burner phone or an iPod Touch, right? Yes. And um, you put in there that her mom accused her of living a double life, in quotes. And I assume that that's in quotes because I assume that's what Ms. Greg told you was that she was li- that her mom thought she was living a double life, right? Correct. <clears throat> And at that po- at that point, Miss Greg thought it was necessary. Uh, Miss Smiley thought it was necessary to get Carly into to therapy and to, to get her some kind of medical treatment, right? I mean, I think fair to say that she thought it was a good idea and right. called for. And 
there at the bottom of your report, you say that uh, Carly liked her therapist a lot and found it helpful to speak with her. She reported that she was forthcoming with the clinicians who prescribed the medication, correct? Correct. And that's what Carly told you. It is. That she was forthcoming, told them everything, right? Yep. <clears throat> Did you review the notes um, from Carly's therapist, Ms. Rebecca Kirk? I did. All right. Is that Magnolia Counseling? Yes. And then you would agree with me, wouldn't you, that not one single time um, there it comes in there in her Maybe. in her therapy notes with Ms. Kirk, does she ever report to Ms. Kirk that she dissociated or heard any voices? Correct. Oh, that's correct. In fact, she answered a questionnaire. Um, from Ms. Kirk's office where she stated she did not hear voices, right? I actually think the questionnaire was from Precise Clinical. You're right. But, but indeed she answered that, that she did not hear voices. Right. And that was a document that we looked at earlier, um, D19, um, with Ms. Todd. Do you recall that? I do. And she had you go through and um, do you still have that document in front of you? No, I'm actually not sure. I think I have it here. Yeah, yes. Wow. And she had you read through several questions. Um, if you'll turn to page stamp 763. Yeah, because I was just asking a moment ago, I, I didn't think he had these records. A moment ago, you, you heard me saying, uh, why would he not have the records or talk to the other therapists? Well, obviously, he did. He had those records. She never reported it. And I had been saying that in other videos, especially when the when the um, schizophrenia came out. It's like, whoa, whoa, stop the presses. Where did this come from? Because schizophrenia, y'all have heard me, I'm not going to reiterate, but it's bad. Especially if you have somebody in your, in your home that has it. You know it. And her dad only said, she just seemed depressed. And now we're finding out she didn't tell her therapist that she's hearing voices. So how, how did we find out about her being six and hearing the voices for the first time when she was six? Where did that come from? Is that just Carly telling him that in the four-hour interview they had together? I, I don't know. Did I miss something? When, when was that documented? Because if it was her mother and a six-year-old is hearing voices, that's disturbing. That is disturbing. Question number 21 states that, have you ever heard things other people couldn't hear, such as voices, and Carly states no, is that right? That is correct. All right, and this is the therapist that she was seeing um, up until actually the day before March 19th, right? Uh, this actually, this is the nurse practitioner. You're, you're right, um, you're right. That she had seen, I think, one week before the incident. Yes, but even the day before, whenever she saw her therapist, Ms. Kurt, she didn't report to her that she was hearing any voices, did she? She did not. Right. And I want to talk to you about, you talked about wow. um, the event that happened on <laughs> Sunday, uh, March 17th, so basically two days before, right? Yes. And um, let's see, I think that is at the top of page eight of your report, is that right? Yes. All right. And you also talked about a journal entry that Carly wrote. Is that correct? Yes. And she said some things in there about either feeling like she was schizophrenic or something along that line, right? So there had been that journal entry from, I think, um, 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 April of 2023. Okay. But I had also talked about a journal entry that she had made on March 12, 2024. Okay. Um, that was on March 12th? She made a journal entry that day, yes. Okay. Um, and then you talk about an event that she had at the top of your report on the uh, the Sunday before. Is that right? Yes. Um, and that's the one where she says she actually smoked some marijuana and then she had this event, right? Yes. So uh, she would do what we, she voluntarily intoxicated, right? She was. Right. Because she smoked the, smoked the marijuana. Yes. <clears throat> Do you know whether marijuana is, uh, recreational marijuana is legal in Mississippi or not? I actually don't know. Okay. <laughs> we just got medical marijuana last year, so. 
record, uh, the, it's not. Um, Objection, or but it moves to strike. Actually, sustain. <clears throat> sustain. And she states that uh, that uh, marijuana is not going to cause you to go and kill somebody. Everybody knows it. It's going to make you tired, lazy, and hungry, and sleepy. Now, she's saying she had a psychotic episode after she took her medicine and smoked a joint. Now, all right, but who cares if it's legal or not, right, in a way? Those EpiPens, I mean, not what are they, those uh, marijuana pens, they have very, they don't have a high concentration of uh, THC in them, from what I understand. And she felt in a way that she had never felt before um, at, in that event on March 17th, right? Yes. And that was after she smoked marijuana? Yes. <clears throat> Unless you go to uh, California or somewhere out west where it, it's legal, and I think their pens are really potent, uh, I have been told. But the ones with the CB, what are they called? CBL, CB, whatever. At the tobacco stores, if she was smoking that, it wouldn't do nothing for her. That's just my opinion. There's there's very, what are they called? A Delta, like a Delta 8, Delta 10, whatever. Because uh, we look, we saw one, because I have, because I, I smoke, and I have a, a one with uh, nicotine in it. <clears throat> And they have the, that mess at the the tobacco store. So if it's not legal there, or if it's just legal for the, the CDLs, that that's nothing. That's not going to do nothing to her. That's what I'm told, by the way. Look at this. She is tuning it out. I just out. want to be clear, Doctor. So we've talked about um, nurse practitioner. Uh, well, we might not have, but we've talked about precise um, neuroscience, right? Yes. And that's the nurse practitioner that she was going to see. Correct. And that her name is Miss Le Olivia Lieber, correct? Yes. All right. And then we've got her therapist over here. So she went to see nurse practitioner Lieber, and then nurse practitioner Lieber referred her to therapy, and that's Miss Rebecca Kirk, right? Correct. And she stated she liked Miss Kirk. Yes. All right, and she was forthcoming with her. Yes. And then you agree with me that she never told either uh, Miss Miss Kirk or Nurse Practitioner Lieber that she ever heard any voices. I would agree with that, yes. All right, and from January the 22nd of 2004 all the way up until the day before this event happened, she was seeing Miss Kirk Basically every week, right? Yes. And sometimes twice a week. Um, yes, I think that's right. Right. And she never said anything to her about voices. Correct. She never said anything to her about dissociating. Correct. Wow. Did she ever say anything to nurse practitioner Lieber about that she was zoning out? I don't believe so, no. And I and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, who did you who did you get that information from that she was zoning out, or that she, that she had ever told him when she was zoning out? Where did that come from in your report? Did Mr. Smiley tell you that that she would zone out from time to time? Mr. Smiley did tell me that. Yes. All right. Her stepdad, correct? Her stepdad. Yes. I don't remember that in any of his testimony that she zoned out. Did I miss something? On page seven of your report, you talk about that the primary source of Carly's anxiety was her will to want to please her mother, correct? That's what she told me, yes. So her main source of anxiety is basically an overprotective mother who wants her to do well, right? I'm not sure I'd say overprotective, although I think Carly probably would. Right. In fact. And Carly's obviously worried about pleasing her. Yes. 
And specifically, what was Carly worried about, her mom finding out? I think that, I think that um, it was important for Carly that she do well in school, uh, that she really excel, because she thought her mother would be proud of her for that. And then later, of course, well, and then she was cutting, as I understand it, for about two years before the incident. So I'm sure that she was, and it's reasonable to think that she was worried that her mother would find out about the cutting. Um, she was using this, this, this iPod Touch in the fall of 2023, and then later a burner phone in 2024. And then, of course, she was smoking marijuana uh, in March uh, and February of 2024. So those were all things that she would reasonably have worried that her mother would uh, find out about and be upset. In other words, uh, that Asha was going to find out that she was leading a double life, right? I, I wouldn't use that phrase. I know that Carly said that her mother had used that phrase. I wouldn't use it. I don't, I don't think that's an accurate portrayal. Well, Carly was worried that she was going to find out that she was leading a double life, right? No, Carly told me that her mother had used that phrase with her. Right. Um, I guess her mother already and found when out. When did Carly say that she started smoking marijuana? Carly told me, I think she told me um, around February of 2024. And I think earlier you said maybe that, um, that, that Carly had told you two to three times a week. I think in your report you say three to four times a week, right? Oh, it's possible. I, think I testified either two to three or I had also seen three to four somewhere in there. And she, uh, she did that all the way up until at least the day before this happened, correct? Correct. So all the way up until March 18th of 2024? Yes. <clears throat> Now, we've heard testimony about some of the medications that Carly was on, and I'm talking about specifically between January and March of 2024. Specifically, we've heard Lexapro and Zoloft, right? Yes. All right. Um, do you have any proof that Carly actually ever took those medications other than what Carly told you? No. no. Okay, so you don't know whether she actually took them or not, do you? I don't know for sure. Of course, I don't know anything for sure. Right. Um, but, the, but what I know is that the medications were filled, and Carly reported to me that she took them regularly, and um, I imagine she reported to the nurse practitioner that she t was taking them. Okay, and you have no... This is... Wow. Carly is not going to be taking the stand. Not after this. I remember when she was asked by the judge... It was up to her. It's it's her decision. Stop looking at your attorney. Because uh, she wanted to wait to see how the testimony was going to go. Sure. The first round with the defense, it was going pretty good. It was long and in-depth on all of these, neuro, uh, not neurological, but mental disorders. And Carly's bipolar 2 has, bouts of, has schizophrenia. She's hearing voices. But Carly... Never told her therapist or the nurse practitioner that she was hearing voices. I still want to know where did it did it come from Carly telling this doctor that she her started hearing voices when she was six? Like where is that? Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Guys, I after just this, what? We're like 15, 20 minutes into cross? No way Carly's taking the stand. Why'd you lie? Why didn't you tell the nurse practitioner? Why didn't you tell your therapist that you were hearing voices? Why'd you hide this? Why, 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 why'd you do this? And she's got to weasel out and say anything. Why'd you lie about the knife? Carly, why do you do what Carly wants to do? I mean. It would be brutal for her to be on the stand. There's no way she's taking the stand. That I, I don't even know if she has, guys. I'm, I'm still systematically going through this. We're, we're finishing up day three. I'm going to let this video run. Um, it might. I'm tr I've been trying to make each one of them an hour, but it looks like um, there's, there's there, there could be some other stuff at the end of this. Maybe if they finish up, I, I don't know. I didn't skim forward yet, but there's no way she's taking the stand, in my opinion. No way. It's this is this right now. This is just canceling out everything that he just did that the defense made made some strides in the case for her. I mean, it had me thinking, okay, if she has this stuff, if she has this list of problems, it's bipolar, bipolar two, schizophrenia. 
She, well, what is that other one? Uh, she disassociates. Uh, she, she had some, some creepy writings in her room that she claims she don't know how it got there. I mean, all of this stuff that the, um, and the meds, all the different depressions, the manic depressions, all of this stuff that they, they brought out was, wow, this is heavy. This is a lot of stuff. But who all knew about it? The only thing they knew is that she was depressed. I don't know. Did she go? My opinion is she, she's not going to be taking the stand. Because this so far, it's been it's This has just chipped away everything that was already established in the defense's uh, direct. That's just my opinion. No, you have no proof that she actually took them as they were prescribed, right? I have no absolute proof of that or... And in anything. fact, she didn't take them as prescribed because whenever she was being weaned off of the Zoloft, she just said she quit cold turkey as you testified earlier, right? I did testify that she stopped the Zoloft abruptly on but, March 12th. Because she said she did. The, what was the recommendation of going down to 25 milligrams? Because right. she, but she said, said she that, did. that she had no withdrawal symptoms from that, correct? That's what she told me, yes. Right. <clears throat> Now, again, um, when did Carly begin taking Lexapro? She began taking Lexapro on March, uh, it was prescribed on March 12th, 2024. It was picked up on March 12th, 2024. I don't know whether she took it that day or the following day. Okay, and so your opinion is based off the fact that she either started taking the Lexapro on either March 12th or March 13th, right? Yes, that's one of the one of the bases of my opinion. Yes. Okay. Um, but again, you don't you don't know whether which day she started taking it on. I don't. All right. Um, and hypothetically speaking, if she told someone that she did not start taking it until March 18th, would that affect your opinion here today? Not substantially. Okay. Because we don't know if and she took you said it or that not. She was prescribed uh, basically five milligrams, right? Yes. And that's essentially half of what the recommended dosage is for a pediatric patient, correct? Yeah, I mean, there's a range of recommended dosages, but it's a, it's a low, I'll say it's a low dose. So the, the general dose is typically 10, is that right? Typically 10. Okay, and of course five would be half of that, right? Yes. <clears throat> this is a Captain Obvious statement, because I am the captain of Captain Obvious. Obviously, there's something wrong with her. She killed her mother, shot her in the face. And nobody has brought up, now this is not Captain Obvious, but nobody has brought up the fact that, and maybe they will. What does it mean when you, when you shoot somebody like that in the face, especially somebody you supposedly loved? It means you have a disdain for them, a hatred or something. But back to Captain Obvious, it's obvious something's wrong with her to follow through on being angry. It's, it's one thing to be pissed and angry at somebody. It's another thing to take it to the unthinkable. And she thought of the unthinkable. Obviously, there's something wrong with her. I'm just going to say it. I, I I know they have to have a defense. Again, if if she is crazy, which she probably is, and whether she has all of these this whole list of disorders, she still needs to be put away. Whether whether she has schizophrenia or not, she killed her mother, shot her in the face. This woman, she should not ever this girl, she's going to be a woman soon. Should be put away forever. And that's not Captain Obvious. Well, maybe that is can be Captain Obvious, but obviously there's something wrong with her. But even still, um, after taking that, at least as of the day before, whenever Carly saw Miss Kirk, she didn't say anything about any voices that she was hearing, right? To, to uh, therapist Kirk. That's correct. She never said nothing. They weren't commanding her to do anything, right? Well, I'm not saying that. She didn't tell Miss Kirk about it. 
Right. She didn't tell Miss Kirk, and the first time she ever said anything to anybody about it was after she was already detained, correct? Although we heard SK testify this morning that she had told her before the incident. Okay, her friend that she still stays in contact with today, right? SK is a friend that she still stays in contact with, yes. Right. <clears throat> And I think in your report, um, as of two days before, that you say that the uh, that what she told you or the voices would simply just still tell her elitist things, right? Yes. And that's what she told you, right? That's what she told me, yes. Isn't it a little bit inconsistent what she was telling her practitioners and her health care providers before she was arrested and then what she was told them after she was arrested? Isn't that inconsistent? Uh, it is inconsistent, right? yes. <clears throat> yeah. You go on to say that even after she started the Lexapro, um, that she did not demonstrate poor judgment or impulsivity, urges for suicide or aggression, and she was still able to focus on her schoolwork. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And supposedly this is the week leading up to March 19, 2024, right? Correct. And all that, you're assuming that she took the medication as it was prescribed? Yes. But you can't confirm that, correct? I can't prove it. And I think I think you actually asked Carly um, about whether she took the medication as prescribed, right? I did. And she told you that she was generally adhering, right? Yeah, I think, I'm not sure I used that, I think even more strongly than that, Carly told me, as I recall, that she was quite adherent with medication. Okay, so... I just had this thought because they're talking about, well, you can't prove if she took the medication. No, he can't. Nobody can. Did they take blood samples of her to, for DNA and run toxicology? I don't know. Did I miss something? Maybe I did. What was the toxicology? What, what all was in her system? Apparently, you smoke pot, it stays. It can stay in your system for like 30 days. But if she's taking the, these medications, there would be signs of it in her blood and how much. I think they could get an idea of how much she had been taking with, with, with just a simple blood test. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Unless there already was and I missed something, and which is very possible. I could be wrong. Uh, page 10, third, third line down, she, I did say, and I think she then told me that she was generally adherent with what was prescribed. Thank you. All right. And um, again, as to page 8, um, looking at page 8 on your report, um, Oh, she is totally bored. You're talking about uh, you're talking about the the day of March nineteenth, right? Uh, yes. All right. And you said she remember waking up, correct? She told you she remember waking up that day. Yes. And uh, she said she was irritable. She didn't sleep much, right? Correct. And she remembers after school going to her mother's classroom, right? Yes. And she said that uh, that her mom actually was clearly upset, right? Yes. And at some point, Miss um, Smiley asked her uh, if she was doing drugs, and she searched Carly's bag, right? Yes. And this was either at school or sometime between when they left school and got home, right? Yes. I didn't know all this. Miss Smiley asked her if she was uh, lying or hiding anything, right? Yes. And like you said earlier, it, it, Carly told you that it seemed like that her mom had a sixth sense, right? Yes. But now we know that out of concern for their friend, some of her friends devised a plan to go talk to Miss uh, Smiley and um, tell her basically that they were concerned for Carly because she was smoking weed and had a burner phone, right? Correct. And you said you watched the video from inside the house. And so whenever you see Miss Smiley and Carly get home, you can see Miss Smiley go directly to uh, Carly's room and start searching. Is that right? All right? Well, you don't see what she's doing, but you see her go directly into the, uh, into the direction of Carly's room. I right? believe so, yes. 
<clears throat> and then Carly kind of goes, listens to her mom to see what she's doing, and then Carly at some point takes the dolls out, right? Yes. And then that's whenever Carly supposedly blacks out. Correct. That's hard to believe. And then comes back to right whenever the deputy picks her up, correct? That's what she reported, yes. All right. Now, we all know there's, there is a defense when somebody gets super angry. Maybe they're in a bar. Maybe some guy insults his, the guy's girl. I don't know. <laughs> I'm lame at examples, but a heat of passion or a heat of the moment, this is not it. She is saying she blacked out. Now, I know some people, they get, uh, we've all heard stories. They get so mad, they, they just see red. And then they just go off. Right? That's, that's plausible. That, that is, but it didn't look like she was in some, she looked calculating. She didn't look like, I don't know, just saying. And now she's claiming she doesn't remember none of it. I don't know. I, that is really, really out there to believe that. Um, and then I believe you say in your report there that she had an awareness that she had done something wrong because she was uh, she found herself in a sewer, right? Yes. All right. Why would she have an awareness that she did something wrong if she doesn't remember what she just did? I, I don't know the answer. I know Big this question. is what she told me. Right. Um, and my, what I took from that was that at that point she did have some awareness um, because there's no particular connection, logical connection between coming out of a storm drain and, then have, and having it actually done something wrong. Right. And the officer, and you saw, you saw the video this morning, the officer, or you saw his testimony, and he stated that he asked her if she was the girl that shot or was involved in the incident, and she said yes, right? Yes. <clears throat> she had total recall. And she said because it seemed like it was the logical thing to do, right? That's what she told me, yes. Which is the same thing that she told the people at the school whenever she brought the knife to school, right? That it seemed like the logical thing to do, or it seemed like the logical thing to say. She did say that, yes. <clears throat> Would also be logical to say, I have no idea what you're talking about to the officer. That could be logical as well. I, well, if he I asks you, if, you if, if an officer stops you and asks you if you just shot someone and you have no recollection of it, wouldn't it be logical to say, I have no idea what you're talking about? It would. Not to say that, yes, because I just thought it was logical, right? Correct. <clears throat> I think he and answered you she was right involved. After being, um, Right after being uh, arrested or detained, it, it, she stated that her uh, her mind was shut off, right? Yes. Um, but she said she was aware of everything that was happening, correct? She did, yes. All right, and so that's after the officer picks her up. Yes. Now, you also talk about in your report after March 19th, March 19th um, you state that Carly reports hearing gunshots in her dreams and feels terrified and paranoid, correct? Yes. Did she say why she heard gunshots in her dream no that she just said she heard gunshots in her dream right? she said there were times that she has I think, I think she used the word nightmares um but that she heard gunshots gunshots and they were scary for her no actually she did not use the word nightmares as i look at my report but she said in her dreams uh and she felt terrified and paranoid and those are the gunshots that she remembers from when she killed her mom i think that's a reasonable presumption she didn't say that specifically right but she supposedly doesn't remember killing her mom, right? Correct. Hence the grandparents and the stepdad. I want to talk about, you talked about side. a couple of the, um, I guess, diagnoses or, or, or opinions that you rendered. And I think kind of one of the first ones where you, talk, you talked about uh, bipolar two, correct? Correct. All right. Um, <clears throat> And you talked about the DSM, correct? Remind us what that is. The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fifth edition, the DSM-5, which 
is the compilation of all the official psychiatric diagnoses. And you're familiar with that document, obviously, because you've been doing it for a long time, right? Yes. All right. Um, and so, uh, and you talked about hypomania, right? Yes. And is that is is bipolar and two and hypomania are those are those terms kind of used interchangeably or are they is one different from the other? One is a little bit different. Bipolar two is the medical condition or it's a psychiatric condition where a person has either depression or hypomania. So hypomania is a component of the bipolar two illness. Right. And you, uh, I believe you have diagnosed or evaluated. Your opinion is is that at some point during this time period between March 12th and March 19th that Carly was um, suffering from hypomania, is that correct? I think, I actually have not testified to that, but I, I think I would likely uh, refer to it as a mixed state. Okay. You can have a mixture actually of um, um, elevated mood and depressed mood, and you can have mood swings that go on as well. I think of it sometimes as stepping on the gas and the brake at the same time. Because um, it wasn't clear to me that, that Carly was purely hypomatic in that time. Okay, um, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna read just here real briefly from the from the DSM um, as far as the criteria criteria for bipolar two. Are you familiar with that? Um, yes. Okay, and the DSM states that. Uh, um, a hypomanic uh, a hypomanic episode is defined as a distinct period of persistently elevated or irritable mood with increased activity or energy lasting for at least four consecutive days. Is that correct? Yes. At any point in your evaluation, were you able to identify a consecutive four-day period where Carly was in an elevated or irritable mood? So Carly reported to me that she was in an elevated or irritable mood for up to seven days at a time. I don't have the specific dates. I didn't ask her for it. I'm not sure if she has it, but I, I don't have the specific dates on the calendar for it. Right. But, um, but that's what she reported. But that's what she reported to you. And was it in a persistently elevated mood or was it up and down like you just testified? She reported persistently elevate, elevated mood. Um, looking back over the preceding five years, what right. she reported to me was that she had these periods, persistently elevated mood where she was, uh, um, she was more, sort of more active, or thought, uh, she was more, uh, more irritable, she was more impatient, she was more impulsive, she did some uh, more impulsive things, she could be more tactless, she could be more rude, she, could, she was more restless. Right, but at least as it relates to Typical between teenager. January and whenever this event happened in March of 2024, um, Certainly, no healthcare provider diagnosed her with bipolar two. Correct. That's correct. And they were seeing her on a regular basis. Correct. They were. Yes. Um, her her therapist sometimes as much as twice a week. Right. Yes. <clears throat> and I believe she was seeing nurse practitioner Lieber um, at least once a month. Right. That's right. She saw her in January, and then she saw her in February, and then she saw her in March. Right? <laughs> correct. Correct. <clears throat> and none of them, none of those. Uh, Healthcare providers identified a, a consecutive four-day period where she was in a hypomanic or elevated state, right? They did not. Okay. But after talking to Carly, now she's told you that she was in an elevated or hypomanic state, right? Yes. And that's six months after she's been charged with murder, right? Yes. <clears throat> Wow. All right. You talked about some um, some of your, uh, I guess, alternative hypothesis, correct? Yes. And one of those was that she just simply panicked um, and out of fear, I guess, of her mom discovering her burner phone and... Uh, her marijuana or her vapes that she just she basically cold-blooded murdered her mom right I'm not sure I would agree with that phrase cold well she panicked and she killed her mom she panicked and she killed her mom. yes that was a hypothesis or a possibility that I considered yes okay so that's one thing that certainly could have happened right yes all right and but, but she the second wasn't. thing that you hypothesized was that she was simply a psychopath and callous and she killed her mom right yes all right but they could certainly both apply to Miss Gray, right? I know, I know your opinion is that they don't, but they certainly could, right? They could potentially, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> now, I guess your opinion here as we sit here today is that 
on March 19th, whenever Carly shot her mom, that she did not, in your word, appreciate the difference between right and wrong, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and you said you watched the videos um, from the house, right? Yes. Okay. Um, is it your opinion that she didn't appreciate the difference between right and wrong whenever she hid the gun behind her back? It's my opinion that in general at that period of time that she didn't appreciate, fundamentally didn't appreciate the difference between right and wrong, although I will also acknowledge the, that she acted in ways like that that would seem to indicate that she had some appreciation. Okay. So I guess, again, I would just simply ask, did, is it your opinion that she did not appreciate the difference right or wrong when she had, hid the gun behind her back? Good point. In my opinion that she did not appreciate the difference between right and wrong at that point, at that time or at any point in time in that, in that period. Okay. Um, and in that video, when she peeks around the kitchen wall after uh, going to retrieve the gun, it, I assume it's your opinion that she didn't know, that she didn't appreciate the difference between right and wrong at that time too, correct? That is my opinion, yes. Okay. Whenever she removed the camera from the wall and hid it in the fridge, it's your opinion that she didn't appreciate the difference between right and wrong. Correct. Oh, but it didn't make no sense, Mary. He said it just didn't make no sense her doing that. When she called and texted multiple friends, but obviously knew that she couldn't tell them what was wrong over the phone, then I assume that you also don't believe she knew the difference between right and wrong at that time. Um, I don't know whether it, it was obvious that she felt like she could not tell them what she had done. I don't know why she didn't tell them. Well, she certainly tell she certainly told them she couldn't tell them, didn't she? Uh, I think that's right. Right. Yes. And did you ever talk or see any uh, talk to or see any text messages from a gentleman named um, Thad Gilbert? I don't remember. I've seen something about him, but as I sit here, I don't remember. I don't think I've seen those text messages. Okay. So sitting here as, as an expert today that you've been, uh, that you've been introduced as an expert and me as an expert, um, if she were to have testified one of her friends, uh, TG, um, and told him that she fucked up, excuse my language, but that's his words, um, if she told him that, then would it be your opinion that she didn't know the difference between right and wrong at that time? It would. All right. What if she uh, told TG that she that he volunteered to call 911? She said, no, you can't do that. I assume she still didn't know that they were right or wrong, right? Yep. Yes. <clears throat> when uh, her friend BG that you talked to or that you talked about earlier, whenever BG told her not to harm herself or anyone else, and she said it's too late, I assume didn't know that they were right or wrong. Correct. When she told her friend that she inv invited over BW, that she put three in her mom, and that her stepdad would be home shortly, and she had three more to take care of him, still didn't know the difference between right and wrong. Correct. <clears throat> and when she ran from the house, after it was all done, she didn't know the difference between right and wrong. Correct. But I guess, in your opinion, a lot of it goes back to the switch in medication, correct? I think that's only a piece of it. I, I think there's much more than that. I think I think the psychosis, I think the the mood swings and mood disorder had been present before then. The psychosis was clearly getting worse by March 12th before the Lexapro was switched. The dissociation had been ongoing. So I think there was I think there was a lot else even before the Lexapro was begun. And then I think the Lexapro was uh, made things worse. Right. But to be clear. You cannot tie her actions, and I believe you stated in your report, you cannot tie her actions on March 19th to the switch in medication, correct? I think the switch in medication had an impact. I think it clearly had an impact. I cannot say Lexapro <laughs> did, made her do this. Right. In fact, you state, in Carly's case, in my opinion, the Lexapro that she began taking clearly worsened her pre-existing psychiatric disorders, leaving her in a highly precarious state, but there is inadequate information available to attribute a direct causality to that medication, correct? That's correct. So you cannot attribute, as you sit here, a direct causality between the Lexapro and what happened on March 19th, correct? Well, I think there's some causality there. I think it made her mood problem worse. I think it made the situation worse. I cannot say that Lexapro made her do it. Right, because you have inadequate information as you stated in your report, right? Correct.
Wow. Of course, indulgence. <clears throat> I want to ask you uh, mm. just a second about um, dissociation, uh, Dr. Clark. And I believe that you stated earlier that um, dissociation is typically uh, more what you would see as a protective mechanism. Is that correct? Well, that's that's one theory for for why it be, how it begins that, that when a person uh, develops trauma, that they use it, they will dissociate as a way of protecting their sort of psychological well-being. That's one one right. theory. And um, I. I've also prosecuted other type of crimes and I know sometimes with like sex offenses that some of the victims will say that they felt like they kind of left their body and that they were maybe over their body like looking down on them. Is that correct? That'd be a type of dissociation. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and, and I believe you stated earlier that in that model that it's typically the victim who is, who is uh, having the dissociation, correct? Good point. Yes, I did say that. Yes. Right, not not the person who's offending, right? Correct. Although there's also, I think, quite a bit written about people who are offending who also experience the association. Right. And again, up until uh, up until March 19th, no um, no healthcare provider uh, ever said anything about Carly dissociating. Correct. That's correct. I believe you, you talked about um, some, some people having uh, adverse, I guess, reactions to SSRIs, stuff like Lexapro, correct? Yes. And I believe you said it was maybe only a very small percent, one to two percent, right? Correct. In terms of the suicidal right. uh, reaction, yes. Right. And you said suicidal, but not homicidal, correct? So I don't know what the data is on homicidal. I know that, that aggression uh, and agitation are known side effects of these medications. They're right. listed in the package insert, um, but I don't know what the actual uh, uh, um, data would show. I'm not sure there is much in the way of data in that regard. Right. And as it relates to the dissociation, you talked about one of the things I guess that typically you see is complete amnesia, right? That's what that's what people who write about it say that you that you tend to see. More, I'm sorry, what they say is you tend to see more patchy amnesia rather than complete amnesia, and people for whom it's, the dissociation is thought to be legitimate rather than malingering. Okay. <clears throat> and as as far as your uh, your theory goes about um, whether or not Carly was callous or anything whenever she did this, you said you don't believe in your interactions with her, uh, you don't believe her to be callous, right? I think not just my interactions with her, but everything I know about her based on all the records and what I've heard from the friends and the family right. um, in general. So overall, I do not believe her to be callous. And that's based off of your four-hour evaluation and the documents that her defense team gave you, correct? In my interview with, um, uh, with Mr. Smiley. Mr. Smiley, who's now supporting her, correct? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean supporting her. There are various meanings of that, so I don't want to agree to something I don't really understand. Okay. I'm surprised they didn't object to that. But maybe they they want the jury to know that the dad's supporting her. They see the grandparents making googly eyes at her. That is so weird. This. Good Lord, there's no way. You'd want this girl to come live with you? No, she shot her mother in the face. No. Are you kidding me? This has been kind of brutal. This has been good. Good and cross examining. Obviously, we've talked a lot about different actions that um, that Carly took uh, after she shot her mom, but before uh, she shot Mr. Smiley. And I asked you whether or not it was um, your opinion uh, that whether or not she knew right from wrong during that time period. Correct. Correct. All right, and you stated that your opinion that despite all those actions, you do not believe she appreciated the difference between right and wrong. Correct. Correct. Is well, there any type of medical literature or anything that you're relying on um, to form that opinion? Well, there is. There's certainly literature on, on dissoci 
literature on dissociation, literature on violence in dissociation. I believe that in my report I referenced um, certain articles. Um, that is, bear with me one moment, on page 23 at the bottom of my report. And in that literature, are, is it simply talking about dissociation, or what's, is that the article, that, the one about dissociation that you're talking about? Yes, the article is called Dissociation, Defining the Concept in Criminal Forensic Psychiatry. So it's talking about dissociation in the context of people who commit crimes, and, such as murder. Thank you. And you admitted earlier that some of those actions certainly looked like she knew the difference between right and wrong, right? Yes. <clears throat> And you saw the video earlier, and um, where did you hear her ask about how's my stepdad uh, in the video earlier with Deputy Chat? I did. Okay. Why would she ask how her stepdad is if she didn't know that she shot or did anything? Um, I think reasonable to conclude that she had some idea that she had done something or something had been done um, that might have imperiled her stepfather. There we so go. So she clearly knew something at that clearly. Point. Right, but she knew something about when she was supposedly blacked out, correct? Correct. And, and I draw, what I conclude from that is that the blackout was not complete, that there was, there was a, some level of awareness that she had. Right. And that's also clear because of all these actions she took to try to cover up her actions, right? She, well, I don't want to presume her motives in doing it, but there's she clearly some pissed. level of awareness in much of what she, she was doing, yes. Right. Damn. Guys, she looks pissed. Nothing further, Your Honor. I don't know. Whoa. Redirect examination. Oh, oh hold on. Shit. Before you get into that, do you have any exhibits up there, Mr. Yes, Center? sir. Yes, sir. Do you mind turning those to the court reporter before you sit down? Oh, my God. That was, that was good. I didn't want to interrupt him. And we're almost done, so I am not going to make a... Uh, Part six. I'm just going to let this run. Wow. She didn't know right from wrong. It was, it, it could have been a combination of the meds, mood swings, uh, <laughs> mood disorders that caused her to go and shoot her mother in the face. Not bringing up the fact was she pissed. That her mom's in her room getting her shit. Her mom is going to put a, a a damper on her lifestyle. No, it was the meds. It was mood swings. It was uh, disassociation. I I think the the prosecution did a great job. Cohen, really? Okay. Did she tell the nurse practitioner or her her therapist she had been hearing voices? No, she never mentioned it. But how convenient that she becomes, she has amnesia at the time of the incident. And then all of a sudden, she's got some forms of schizophrenia. She, this is what now I'm questioning. Is she, is she smart enough to manipulate? It says that she, she knew she could act happy when she wasn't. She could put on a show, more or less, is what the prosecution got out of him. I mean, this is poked holes into uh, the knife. She lied about the knife. She didn't report. She had talked to the nurse practitioner a week before the incident. Never said nothing about having any kind of issues with uh, all that stuff he listed, I, I, the, the the voices is the thing I can't get past. So she she never mentioned that. Why would she not want to mention that? She's already seeing a a, a, a therapist because she's got some depressive problems. Why would she not tell them? Because probably, folks, she don't have schizophrenia. Probably, folks, she does not have schizophrenia. And hyper manic? I mean, all right. 
I, is the jury buying any of this? I not after the prosecution just just chipped away out of all of that that the the defense just laid out. It's uh, he didn't see all the video. He didn't see the mom coming in. Why would he not watch the whole entire thing? I don't know. He didn't see all the text messages to put things in context. He should have seen that. Would it help him? He said, yeah. He said, would it help you if you seen it all? Yeah, it would help him. He didn't have all the info when he first evaluated her. He didn't have, he didn't have everything. He should have waited. They should have waited. She said she was sorry. So that, what, she, that's going to make her aware and why she's in the back of the police car? But no. She all of a sudden had total recall when she kind of crawled out of the, the little sewer. So, let's see if the defense could try to get some points back. Because um, I think the, the prosecution just did a great job chipping away at all that. And she's just, she's just a, a teenager who just wanted her mother out of the way. She's pissed at her mom. I don't know. That's how it's looking. Take that to Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. There's one page laying up here loose. I just okay. Make sure it's in those wrappers. Yes, sir. All right, here she goes. <laughs> And if that was your copy, that's fine. I just want to make sure that it's not missing. Right there. Yeah, I'll tell you what, while, uh, while we're getting all our exhibits back together, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, let's go ahead and take a quick restaurant around, okay? I'm going to try to redirect at this point in time. We would like to offer Dr. Clark's report uh, into evidence. Y'all approach. The prosecution does not want that report in evidence. Wow. I think that's objection four. His report. I thought they were going to let it in. I missed something. It's probably going to. I, I think this judge is going to go, hey, he's done said all of this. He's done been cross-examined. Man. Yeah, he probably does need to let it in. Unless they got a good darn reason that there's not going to be a... Yes, ma'am. Be more defendants next in number for ID purposes. A lot for, for an appeal, you know. They, they don't want to have anything that they could say. Well, we we they didn't let us get the evidence in, and we want an appeal if she's if she's found guilty. Doctor Clark, did you come to your conclusions to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? I did. Yeah, but it's still Dr. an Clark, opinion. During your interview with Carly, who answered your questions? Carly did. And during your that. evaluation and interviews, who controls that? I did. And what would you do if you were having any issues with your evaluation? I would try to change the circumstances because having a accurate, a, uh, appropriate evaluation is sort of critical to the work I was doing. And how, based on your experience and expertise, how common is it for people to feel like they're in a surreal state, out-of-body experience when they are discussing traumatic events? I'd say certainly not uncommon. I think many people that have had traumatic experiences do have the experience of, of feeling distant from it or feeling some, somewhat out of body. Okay. And 
Had you explained the term disassociating to Carly during your evaluation? No. And was Carly already on Abilify when you interviewed her? She was. How long had she been on Abilify when you interviewed her? I saw her on August 29th and she started on Abilify on March 20, uh, 28th. So that would make it uh, five months. And what dosage of Abilify was Carly on when you interviewed her? I believe she was on 10 milligrams a day. Okay. And do you recall how long she'd been on 10 milligrams a day by the time you interviewed her? I believe her dose was increased from seven and a half milligrams to 10 milligrams in I think either June or July. And did your conversation with BG change your the opinion that you came to in your report? No. And you spoke with him after you you uh, produced your report? Yes. And did you hear SK testify this morning regarding her text messages to Carly? Yes. Did you hear SK this morning reading out her text messages with Carly from yes. March 19th? Yes. Did that change your opinion? No. Okay. Is it fair to say that if you find yourself suddenly crawling through a drainage ditch, you know something's wrong? Wow. Wow. Uh, Dr. Clark, based on your evaluation with Carly, Reaching. did Carly seem aware of how she got to the drainage ditch? No. Okay. But that was the first thing she remembered after taking the dogs out? Yes. Uh, did Carly seem to know that it wasn't right for her to be there? Yes. Okay. Okay. And mm -mm -mm. Dr. Clark, you know, if a if Dr. Clark, if a child knows that law enforcement is looking for them, you know, what are they? What is the logical conclusion they are likely to come to? Hide. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're asking. Okay. Let me rephrase, it's a bad question. Uh, if, if a law enforcement officer, uh, if a law enforcement officer has a child and is taking a child in, into custody and arresting that child, is it a logical conclusion for that child to come to that they're in trouble for something? Yes. And would it be logical for the child to come to that conclusion even if they didn't know what they did? Objection, Your Honor, deleting. Stunning, and would a child, or let me see this, and do you believe that a child who is being arrested, um, well, I'm gonna run, let's go. And during your uh, evaluation and your review of records, do you recall reviewing uh, some counseling records of Kevin Greggs? Yes. And do you well, recall? I apologize. I, re I recall reviewing a record from the psychiatrist, right. Dr. Hardy, for Kevin Gregg. Yes, and that, that's what I meant by medical record. And based on your review of that record, do you recall the medication Thorazine? Yes. And who had been prescribed that? So Mr. Gregg had been prescribed, I believe I saw three medications listed, Thorazine, Risperdal, and Zyprexa. Let's start with Thorazine. What kind of medication is Thorazine? Thorazine is an antipsychotic medication, and sometimes called the first generation uh, antipsychotic. It's an older medication. Okay. And what was the second medication you said you observed? Uh, Risperdal. And what type of medication is Risperdal? Risperdal is also an antipsychotic medication, and is, is considered as a second generation uh, 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 antipsychotic. Okay. And what is the third medication that Mr. Gregg had been prescribed? Zyprexa was the third medication, also a second generation antipsychotic. And. Uh, did you also observe in those records that Mr. Gregg had been hospitalized? Yes. And based on the medical records that you reviewed uh, from Precise Medical Records and, and all the and Ms. Kirk's medical records, um, are were those medical records received in response? Were they produced in response to subpoenas directly to the various medical providers? I believe they all were, yes. Okay. So it wasn't something that I drafted up or something that Mr. Camp drafted up and sent to you, correct? To the best of my recollection, all of those documents came with subpoenas. Okay. 
And did I hear you correctly when you said it was a nurse practitioner at Precise Medical Clinic that prescribed Carly her medication? I believe that Ms. Lerber is in fact a nurse practitioner. Okay. Not a psychiatrist. Not a psychiatrist. Dr. Clark, does a person always know if they've lost time? No. Okay. Dr. Clark, can a person know they've lost time if they have no memory of it? Location, Your Honor. I think it's outside the schedule. Cross. Coral overrule it. If it's touched on about her, her alleged disassociation, I'll allow him to answer the question. Could you please repeat the question? Yes. Can a person always know that they've lost time if they have no memory of it? No. I think some people are aware that something has happened, um, uh, and some people aren't very aware at all. Okay. And when you revert, when, I'm sorry, when you reviewed Rebecca Kirk's records, uh, did you see information in there regarding that Ashley Smiley had also spoken with Ms. Kirk? I believe so, yes. Okay. And, you know, and based on your evaluation of Carly, uh, was Carly afraid that her mother would find out that she was having these mental health issues? Yes. Okay. Is it reasonable that Carly would not want to disclose that she was having these mental health issues to someone she knew was talking to her mom? Yes. Okay. Earlier in your testimony, you talked about how Carly was a follower. Um, and if someone has more of a follower personality, are they likely to argue with law enforcement? Objection, Your Honor. Outside the scope. Your Honor, he brought it up on cross. Why wouldn't she have said, why wouldn't she have argued? Overruled. You can answer. I'm not sure being a follower makes much difference in that regard. I'm, I would imagine that for a 14-year-old who's being arrested or picked up by the police, they're not likely to argue. Uh, I see, again, I see Carly as a pleaser. Perhaps that's more germane. I, th I think it's likely. That, I think it's unlikely Carly would have actually argued. That's not something that she that would, that would, that would be characteristic of her. And do you recall your testimony earlier today when you were talking about dissociative disorders and acute dissociative reactions to stressful events? How you testified that Carly met most of the risk factors. <laughs> Yes, I believe I talked about the factors that would make it seem more likely that it was the real, the real deal as opposed to malingering. And I believe you testified, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the only, the only factor that Carly didn't really meet was that she didn't seem to have any recollection of it instead of spotty recollection, correct? Yes. Sustained is deleting. Okay. And would it be fair to say that if Carly's nightmares of the of gunshots were somehow her memories of that incident then then that would fit even more perfectly with your uh with your diagnosis that the, the risk factors you can answer yeah i wouldn't say perfectly i wouldn't use that word the other thing i'd say i wouldn't put too much stock in this whole thing this is information that we have from the research that there is it's not great research um so again, I wouldn't put too much stock in it, but yes, the fact that, that she would seem to have some awareness of what had gone on, some post-traumatic symptoms associated with it would make her amnesia a little more patchy. Okay, and so having that patchy memory would fall in line with someone who is genuinely experiencing dissociative amnesia. Yes, again, this is not proof. This is not proof that she experienced dissociative amnesia, but it would be a factor excuse me, weighing in that direction. I just woke everybody up. And Dr. Clark, when we saw the body camera footage today, when Carly and Deputy Shack arrived back at Carly's house, were there already law enforcement videos and an ambulance there? I actually couldn't see the video itself from where I was, from where I was sitting, so I'm not sure. Okay. And if, if that is what the video portrayed, you know, would it be, how likely would it be, or would it be logical for someone to believe something has happened? I think it, it would be very logical for someone to think that something um, had happened, yes. Uh, begging the court's indulgence.
think this is starting to be a losing battle for the defense. I don't know. Thank you for your questions, Your Honor. We'll tender the witness. All right. You may stand down. Defense may call us next witness. Your Honor, the defense arrested this time. What? Ladies and gentlemen, jury. Daniel I suspected Hossack. it. Yeah, I'm just giving five minutes. Take my name's arrest right now. Be a good time, okay? <laughs> what? I. I suspect that they were resting everything on the testimony of this witness. So they called the dad, the stepdad. They called Shaq, Officer Shaq. And then they called the doctor. They had three. That's it. Record will reflect we're outside the presence of the jury. Does the defendant re urge his motion? Yes, we do, Your Honor. All right, any further basis you wish the court to consider? No further basis. Does the state re urge us? Does the state argue the same response as before? Yes, sir, with additional information that's been put in. Feel free to put it in. Okay. Wow. Any further argument? No, sir. All right. Court will overrule the motion for directed verdict for the record. All right, does the state have a. We all had a telephone call uh, about a week and a half ago. <coughs> You had a witness with a scheduling problem, is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Still have the scheduling problem? Uh, that's correct, Your Honor. For Friday. For Friday. Mm -hmm. So I can recess. I mean, it's it's 447. What I'm saying is I can recess for the night. I should recess for the night. But if if you have a witness problem, it's Wednesday night. Folks go to church. If, if you have a witness problem, we spent about an hour taking care of something else. I will call. I'll, I'll let you call the witness now. But if we don't have a witness problem, I want to rest. I want to be done for the night. Your Honor, can I make sure we have two witnesses upstairs that are pretty short? Can I just make sure that they can both be back tomorrow? Yep. Uh, Y'all mind checking on that one this time? And for those who want to check, it, it's not a convenience issue. It, it's an availability yes. issue. Yes. Okay. And Dr. Pickett's in the courtroom. He is available tomorrow. Okay. Your Honor, can we approach real quick? Sure. Okay. Wow, how much is left on here? Just a couple of minutes. I, I don't think they're going to have... Uh, I don't see them pulling a witness on. Wow! The defense rests. Day three. It looks like the prosecution's going to have a couple of witnesses to come up. I'm curious to see what who are they and what are they going to say. And then we're going to get the closing arguments. Man. I don't think that defense proved anything that they said in the opening statement. Because I think there was evidence that her mother found something in her room. There is evidence that Carly was doing stuff she wasn't supposed to be doing. There's no evidence that the cops did anything wrong. With the body cam and it's, that, I just thought that's just not going to fly. The, everything they stated in the opening, I don't think they hit any of it. Now, the prosecution, yeah, we're going to show you. We've got video. We got a terrifying, horrific nine one one call. Carly, Carly did this. Man, this is uh, this is bad. This is real bad for Carly. Look, she's fooling with her hair. Wow, she said thank you. Yeah, you know, she's probably just trying to make her feel better, obviously, because this is bad, and they probably know what it. it's bad. Did they make any grounds with this jury, with this doctor, on proving... Now, I took some notes here. I don't think they proved she's insane. They're just saying she had a blackout. Just because you had a blackout doesn't mean you're insane. She's pleading insanity. And, and then them pointing out the fact that... While they're doing it, that, I want to look ahead to jury instructions. 
I got uh, I got S one through S seven, and I it, got D. Uh, D1 Carly is through, a pleaser uh, on D6. redirects. Is that, is that what does that say? What we have is that correct? Is she trying to please okay. the court? Is she pleasing the doctor? Hey, She's pleasing everybody. Correct. She's just pleasing everybody. No, I'm not putting the cart before the horse, but just make sure they were exchanged. Yeah, they are done. They are wrapping this up. They got just a couple of minutes left. I'm going to turn this down. But, they, you know, they established on redirect. Carly is a pleaser. So is she was she pleasing the doctor while he's interviewing her? We've established she's a pleaser, guys. And she's an actor. And she lied. Let's get started around. And she's a murderer. These are all the things that were established that she is. The defense is in trouble. It's bad. All right. I'm going to bring the jury back in. Uh, I'll tell them to be here at 845 tomorrow. Give them my instruction. Anything further from the state before I bring in the jury? From the defense. All right. Bring them in. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this up. I don't think they're going to have anything else other than bring the jury in. He's going to give them some instructions. Man. All right. So now we have to go day four. I think I wonder if they're gonna wrap it all up in one in day four. I don't know. I haven't researched it. I will find out though. All right, that's it. There you go. That's the rundown. Is this all gonna play out with the jury? She's manic. She's bipolar. <laughs> She's hypermanic. She's schizophrenic. She has disillusion. <laughs> so the cutting. Uh, the the, the bio-dead having mental problems. <laughs> All of this stuff compiled and compiled. This is what led to her killing her mother? We will see. We will see.